It's Mike again with Uketastic. I'm still here today at the GoTo Comp Chicago 2013. Right now, I'm sitting down with Ola Bini. Ola is, uh, has been a kind of a prolific uh, committer to open source, and most uh, probably, I'm assuming, most dear to your heart is your your own language, Ioki. Um, well, first, thank you for sitting down with me to talk. And what is Ioki, and, and why did you create it? So. Ioki is a programming language. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an experiment, first and foremost. I, I decided to create it because I was at the point in my language interest, because mm -hmm. I, I've been part of the JRuby project for many years, mm -hmm. and before that I was part of another, uh, another language implementation on the JVM. And uh, for a long time I've been kind of searching for the right language uh, on the right platform. And uh, JRuby was a good step in the right direction, um, but Ruby as a language still didn't have everything I wanted a language to have and I, I wasn't really sure. I was looking around, I was learning a lot of other languages, teaching myself uh, most of the languages out there to some degree or another and trying to find something that suited me and at some point I just gave up and decided to, okay, I'm just going to try creating something myself and see where that ends up. Just explicitly experimenting, making it a laboratory for things instead of something that is supposed to be useful. So. I went in with it expecting it to be slow, expecting it to not necessarily have all the features that a, that a general purpose language really has to have. Um, and it's played out really well. Uh, I've had a maximum of 10 users. People are poking <laughs> on it, testing it, and uh, doing fun stuff with it, but it's more of an inspiration to people yeah. more than anything else. And I've done a lot of crazy stuff that I quite like in it. It is a dog slow. It's not useful for real right. purpose things. Um, I think this at this point it was probably six or seven years ago since I started creating it but that was kind of where it started out so it is a language that is based on the JVM okay that was on purpose uh, because I wanted to bootstrap based on all the existing stuff that was available on the platform the GC the libraries all that stuff that makes it so much easier to do stuff uh, without having to build it all from scratch um, I started with a design that is very similar to a language called I.O. Okay. Uh, that run, uh, is a small embedded language in, um, uh, that runs in C, uh, um, uh, is written in C. Uh, I.O. has a very different standard library. Uh, and that's the core library and the core implementations are quite different. Uh, fundamentally, at the lowest level, Ioki and Io can do very similar things, but okay. everything on top of the core message sending routines are quite different. And, and specifically, Ioki has a lot of inspiration from Lisp when it comes to to, um, to thinking around macros, and, and also uses a lot of small talk thinking when it comes to first um, or higher order uh, concepts, uh, having first class versions of everything in, in the system, and so on. Well, if if it there's a with the, the, the expressiveness of, because I, I read a little bit about the Wikipedia page, I, mm -hmm. haven't, I haven't tried Aoki yet, but it's it. What I understand is that you, where Lisp had to make certain trade-offs to become performance and, and yeah. usable, you're not making those trade-offs in in favor of strict adherence to what your design principles yeah. are. But I have to wonder: is there certain problems that you could solve with Aoki that, while they might not be fast? maybe can be more expressive. Is, is there something that you can do with Ioki that you could easily do with uh, another language, even all this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that modeling some kinds of things are actually really powerful in Ioki. And, and so let me just talk quickly about, so the basic language features that makes Ioki different from a Lisp is really that it is a prototype-based, object-oriented language at the core of the language. and. Um, that, that is really visible all through the whole thing. It embraces mutability at every level, so everything in the system is available at runtime in the system. Um, a small example, and this is something that makes it very easy to do domain specific languages in IOKI, is that you actually have access to the parsing tables and you can modify the parsing tables at runtime. Uh, fundamentally, IOKI, IOKI syntax is a very simple prefix uh, engine, but it does, something, um, it does something that I call operator shuffling where you really um, fundamentally can change the reorder, the, the precedence of different operators. You can add new operators. You can strip away and have no operator whatsoever. But at the end of the day, they will all um, compile down. They will all parse and shuffle down into a canonical AST. 
and that canonical AST at runtime is available also at runtime. In fact, um, every time you call a method, that is represented as a first class message that you have access to if you want to. And um, that you, if you call a method, that method can have access to the outside context of where it's called at runtime, which means that in fact, since the AST is mutable at runtime, you can have methods that can reach back into the point where they were called and modify the code at that point if you want it. So you can have macros that have effects outside of the inside of the macro if you want to, for example. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this video a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was, I was, I was laughing because it, what, the reason I was starting to laugh is because I, I, obviously uh, you're somebody who's extremely comfortable with dealing with multiple languages and have really delved into how languages even work. Mm -hmm. um, in in your talk, you talk that, that you use about seven to eight languages in, in the uh, in yeah. the in the, uh, uh, the the cancer research problem. I I just want to go back to like a young Ola who who was in school. Uh, how did you get involved in like how did where did the language bug bite you? That's a very hard question. Um, because, so I started programming when I was seven years old. Okay. Um, that was basic on an Apple IIc. I, I started writing small games and stuff like mm -hmm. that at that point. And then uh, I very quickly went through C, C++, and assembler because I, I would... Uh, so in Scandinavia, there was this... Um, there was something called the demo scene. Uh, that grew out of uh, the pirating, uh, the, okay. the games pirating, where, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, in the 80s and 90s where you, where you got a pirated game, you usually had an intro to the game mm -hmm. where the pirating group, they kind of did a presentation uh, showing how cool and elite they were, oh. and then the real game started. Right. Now, those kind of intros, they kind of, um, they kind of cropped off and, and took off separately from the pirating movement mm -hmm. and became kind of a scene by itself where people were trying to impress each other, come up with really impressive graphical things that did... Uh, I mean, it's almost like small, small movies doing, uh, doing yeah. programming. And I was deeply involved in that movement. There were things like uh, doing the coolest uh, presentation you can do in 64 kilobytes of space, right. for example. So I did graphics programming, and, and in order to learn, I, I would, I mean, you have to use C or C++ for the top level, uh, top level stuff. You had to use assembler for the graphic routines. You had to be able to understand Pascal as well, because half of the tutorials and stuff like that was in Pascal, and half of it was in C. So in order to learn all the techniques, you had to switch back and forth. Um, all the C, all the all the 3D uh, engines were written in C++, so you had to get into that. And at that, at some point, um, I don't know, I became very used to switching between those and then I branched out I found Lisp and then I yeah it just branched out and then um, I did Java for a few years uh, in a corporate setting or actually not a corporate in a university setting right. um, but I, I worked for the IT department and, and did Java development for them and I, I realized that I was very unhappy with the capabilities of these languages so I started branching out this was probably when I was 19 20 I started learning more and more languages just to find something better because I was so dissatisfied with the um, with the capabilities of the existing languages, with the way the way the code grow like crazy, right. uh, with the limited abstraction capabilities and so on. And so, so because you were exposed to so many languages at a young age, and and the hard internals. I suspect so. Yeah, because the other thing that I I I have a strong belief in the power of programming languages mm -hmm. to help us manage complex problems. I think that's really important. But I also believe that the best programmers out there are the ones who understand the whole machine, the whole stack, has a full system level understanding so that when you use a really high level feature, you know what the cost is and you know when to use it and when not to use it. You know when you can just ignore it completely and just focus on the high level stuff and you know when you actually have to think about it. Mm -hmm. So do you think there maybe there's a, uh, an, I just have to wonder now, since so much of our languages are really high abstraction languages, they really hide a lot of all of that internals. Do you think that maybe there is there is a, a negative trend as kids are learning those really high abstraction languages and they're not seeing some of the internals? Is there maybe a danger in that? Well, I mean, okay. So let me first make one point, and that is, I don't actually believe that our languages are that high level right now. I, okay. I mean. A language like Java, for example, is very low level, and that still was used for most of the uh, C and T, C sharp, and, and Java are really like still the major programming languages, and they are not high level. 
Uh, in fact, one of the problems with them is that they don't hide enough of the machine. They're this kind of weird mix of uh, trying to be high level in one area and then showing their uh, patties in the other one. It's, well, uh, I, I think it's more of what I was, not so much that I'm dealing with registers and, and interrupts and, and things like that, but that dealing with really moving memory from here to here and then jumping and making uh, making really low level and having to think in this very um, concrete low level like with Java I'm just going to say I'm going to call a collection and I'm going to iterate over it mm -hmm. and I'm not thinking about what that iteration yeah. is really doing um, you know, that it's, it's sure. moving and incidentally I mean that, that whole approach in Java 8 is going to change because then you have to stop thinking about it as iterating because iterating is actually it's too tied to the implementation pattern and maybe iterating like actually going from next pointer is going to be the wrong approach when you're using lambdas and streams in, in Java 8 instead but I, I think going back to your original question uh, I think that the main problem is not so much that our high level languages are hiding this stuff I think that uh, the way we are teaching uh, new programmers how to deal with things at different levels should change. Mm -hmm. I think that we are de-emphasizing things too much. Um, I, I, I actually believe it's good that people learn a lot of different languages, but that mm -hmm. we don't have the choice to use the language at the right abstraction level for what we need to do. So but I feel still that we are missing. We have all this low-level stuff and then up to a specific point, but then we're actually missing this really, really high-level stuff mm -hmm. that will allow us to manage much more of the complexity than, than what we're doing today. And I think that a lot of the today's focus on functional programming is actually misdirected. Um, it's misdirected uh, unhappiness with the fact that we don't have other high level mechanisms right now. It, it makes me kind of think about uh, Dan North's talk about dogma. And, and it sounds like, um, you know, before we had, we well, can't have procedural programming, you have to have object oriented. And now everybody's dogmatic about doing object. Mm -hmm. Now it's the new dogma is. Well, if you're not doing functional, you're not cool, but, you know... Uh, That's true. It's and, and it's kind of funny, coming off a project that, where I've used the functional language for the last year as the main language, it's like, I'm still not a functional... Uh, I, I mean, I don't think functional is going to solve anything. I think some functional is a useful tool, just like all the other tools, but the reason we use Clojure was not because it's functional, it's because it's a Lisp. Right. And those two things are not actually the same thing. Uh, you can use a Lisp uh, for macros and data structure, for example, without really caring about the fact that it's functional, and the other way around. Okay, and is is you? I'm gonna just jump over to the to the JRuby project mm -hmm. now. Um, the closure. Now I'm struggling for the question I want to ask, but I, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. But you you've you've worked on Lisp and you've worked uh, uh, you know on really understanding how the JVM works. How did you get involved with working on the um, with JRuby? Because it seems like Ruby and, and and the Lisp community seem to have a very different approach to designing software. You know, do you, you're obviously comfortable in moving between multiple languages, but when you look at the two, the Closure community and the JRuby community, what what really differences do you see there? And in, in, in not just not just the languages themselves, but the users and, and the community around them. Hmm. It's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, I think there is a lot of things in common, especially if you take away just the JRuby community, and not just not the whole Ruby community, but right. the JRuby community. I actually think that there are more things in common between the JRuby and Clojure community than anything else. And I mean, you can see that many of the companies and people that were big on using JRuby and Ruby, like Relevance, for example, mm -hmm. have actually kind of gone into using Clojure for a lot of what they're doing. But they're not giving up on JRuby, they're just using it for some parts of the system. I think what I'm seeing, that the most thing that I see in common is actually that these the people who are doing this are the people who are pragmatic. They're the ones who build real world, complicated systems where they actually need the benefit of something like Clojure for, for leverage. But um, running on the JVM is a pragmatic choice and, and using JRuby for other parts where, I mean, JRuby still has a lot of benefits when it comes to libraries, I would say, because um, like, or even frameworks like uh, Rails is a good example. I actually, I, I don't use Rails that much anymore, but uh, you still have lightweight li uh, libraries like Sinatra. You still have really lightweight, simple ways of dealing, slicing and dicing data and stuff like that. And, um, and using the right tool for the job, I mean, that seems to be what unifies the JRuby and the closure people to a large degree. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, just a, a, a last kind of final wrap-up question mm -hmm. is, if somebody's looking at, uh, interested in digging into Yoki and, and trying to understand it and using it to better understand languages, where, mm -hmm. where should they start? Well, you can, you can definitely start with the guide. It's a fairly complete guide. Uh, the source code is not that large, and a lot of it is actually written in Ioki itself. Um, I think one of the more interesting aspects of Ioki was that uh, I wrote the whole thing uh, TDD. So there is a complete uh, test uh, code base that, that covers the whole language. So when I created the .NET version of Ioki, I just let the tests actually guide the whole implementation. So it was very easy to make a port of it to, to C Sharp uh, and F Sharp. Um, so looking at the tests, looking at the uh, the internal implementation is actually, I, I mean, it's not a big project by itself, so I think that should be easy. Since I don't do a lot of fancy stuff in order to make it really fast, the code is not as impenetrable as, as some other language implementations can be. Like, JRuby has fantastic source code, it's beautifully written, but it is written with more than an eye to performance, and that sometimes uh, you, you have to read a lot to understand the, the things that uh, make it necessary to do things a specific way, for example. Okay. Uh, so, but is there, is there a website, Ioki? Yeah, Ioki.org. Ioki.org. Yeah. Okay, so go check out Ioki.org and then and try to expand your uh, your language horizons. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah.